The Mew 2 is Grimm's long-awaited digital player with major DAC. It integrates Rune Server, Rune Endpoint, Grimm's unique pure Nyquist Sova sampling and both a digital and pure analog preamplifier. February 2019, Grim Audio introduced their Mu1 music player, designed to feed their LS series of loudspeakers. But it can also be used to stream digital music to a third party DAC. I reviewed the Mu1 three years later and bought it immediately to replace my Aurelic Aries 2 and Chord Scala. The pure Nyquist oversampling and the extremely high quality clock signal in the Mu1 was so much better sounding. At the High End Muni 2023 show, Grim Audio announced the Mu2, in essence a Mu1 with integrated DAC, that can work both as digital and analog preamp. Both players use the unique Pure Nyquist subsampler. But let's first see where the Mu1 fits into your stereo. The Mu1 connects to analog inputs on your amplifier using either RCA or XLR cables depending on your amp. The amp has to be connected to a pair of loudspeakers unless you want to listen to headphones. Those can be plugged in to the Mu2 directly. It also needs to be connected to the internet over your network using a network cable. Wi-Fi is not supported. It needs internet to have room function, partly to get the metadata and partly to check your license for you need a subscription to Rune separately for either $150 per year or $830 for a lifetime subscription. In the future Grim Audio will add functionality so another system, I guess DNA, can be used too. The Mu players can be ordered with optional internal storage of either 2 or 8 terabytes. Alternatively they can be used with an external USB drive or with a shared volume on a computer or NAS. This can be set in Rune using a tablet, smartphone or computer. Music can be copied to the Mu2 from your computer to the local drive over the network, but a USB drive is mounted as read only. If you have a subscription to either Tidal or Cobus, that can be used too. A CD player or CD deck can be connected to the Mu2 over SPDIF or Toslink. It will pass the pure Nyquist upsampler, is reclocked and passed over to the major deck which will give a remarkable improvement in sound quality. You can even do the same with your TV using a Toslink or SPDIF cable. An analog source can also be connected, like for instance a phono preamp, a tuner or tape deck. In this case the signal will remain analog. The volume control is done by relays and thus is analog. The exterior design is equal to that of the Mu1, with only three differences. On the front it says Mu2. The control disc on the top is silver coloured instead of gold and the rear panel is quite different. More on that later. All sides are anodized aluminium. The top is curved to make place for the control wheel. The player measures 355 by 295 by 85 mm and weighs 4.78 kilos. The front is kept rather uncluttered. Like with all Grim Audio products, the power indicator is a small LED that forms the dot on the eye of the Grim logo. The color display shows sampling frequency, input, volume level, artist, album, track name and a progression bar. Via the control wheel a menu can be activated to either put the player in standby or change the settings. One of these settings gives the Grim Audio access to the player for troubleshooting. The access will be closed down by Grim Audio when the troubleshooting session is finished by rebooting the player. Other settings can also be done via an HDMI menu on a computer, tablet or smartphone. I'll come back to that. On the rear we see the Gigabit Ethernet connector with above it a USB 2 connector that accepts 
not only storage media but also a USB DAC. But it will bypass the oversampling and reclocking, so it's best to use for USB storage only. Then the digital inputs. Toslink Optical, Spider on RCA and AES EBU on XLR. The analog inputs and outputs are available as balanced on XLR connectors and single ended on RCA connectors. The balanced inputs are next to the balanced outputs and the signal path through the MU2 remains balanced. The single ended inputs are next to the single ended outputs. Above it the 6.3 mm headphone jack can be found. An infrared eye is supplied for those that want to use an infrared remote control. It has to be connected here. The IC mains inlet and power button are situated here. Any mains voltage between 100 and 240 volts, 50 or 60 Hz will do. After opening the cover, loosening the power supply board and flipping it to the left, this is what you see. This is a switch mode power supply that looks to be separated for several parts of the player. An industrial grade computer board with Intel i3 CPU at 2.4 GHz that runs 4 cores and does 4 threads using hyperthreading. It has 8 GB of DDR4-2133 RAM, an internal SSD for the TinyCore Linux OS and room server. A second large SSD for music storage is optional. The review sample had a 2 TB Samsung SSD mounted here. The computer sends the audio data over a PCIe bus to the FPGA board that does the 128 times pure Nyquist oversampling, noise shaping and reclocking. Here also some system control like standby and infrared finds place by a Motorola microprocessor. Below the FPGA board there is a large blue circuit board. This part of the board holds the DAC circuitry and a special analog low pass filter on which further on more. Below the FPGA board the analog volume control is situated, built with a number of relays, plus the analog output stages. A few weeks prior to making this review, Gertjan Groothulzen and Peter Meyer from Grim Audio gave a presentation at the Dutch Audio event 2023 on the D2A conversion in the MU2, which helped immensely in understanding how the major DAC works. After the presentation I had a conversation with both of them. Just like Ted Smith for PS Audio and Rob Watts for Court Electronics, Grootholzer and Meyer started developing D2A technique as a hobby and only in a later stage started working for Grim Audio to make it a commercial product. Grootholzer and Meyer, of course, had the advantage of working together. For the D2A conversion they considered both non-oversampling and oversampling, looking at digital accuracy, timing errors and amplitude errors. Non-oversampling was considered to have too many limitations while their pure Nyquist oversampling in the MU1 already had proven its added value in sound quality. They analyzed bitstream like used for DSD. Such a 1 bit signal had a signal to noise ratio of only 6 dB's and thus noise shaping is needed to move the noise outside the audio band. The problem with just 1 bit is that the amplitude of the HF noise is audio signal dependent. This results in noise modulation in the audio band that impacts the sound quality. Most bitstream problems are therefore related to using only one bit. Grothulze and Meyer found a solution by using the two signal levels of one bit but with three different durations. This way there are no linearity errors and no noise modulation. How does this work? In this graph along the top I show the effective output level and along the bottom the theoretical bit value. Level minus one is low, level zero is low during half the period and high during half the period. To have it graphically work better I'll insert a zero bit value again and then a level plus one, theoretically one and a half bit. This is a basic form of pulse width modulation which is normally used with more width variations. 
but it turned out that three signal widths was already enough to get rid of all the noise modulation in the audio band. When using one and a half bit the noise level is still far too high so noise shaping has to be added. Grim Audio designed a 11th order noise shaper that is implemented completely lossless and offers extreme output resolution. As a bonus it has extended dynamic range and allows signals above 0 dBFS. This means that the minus 3 dB trick as I discussed in my video improve the sound quality of your DAC for free is not needed here. Next the high frequency noise of the shaper is filtered before the first analog stage by using an optimized 16 tap analog fair DAC filter with 16 DACs per channel. Like everyone in digital audio Grim Audio realized the importance of using an extremely stable clock and jitter suppression. For external digital sources both Grim players use a frequency locked loop, FFL for short, rather than a phase lock loop or PLL. The FPGA is clocked by a tentlapse clock crystal while the audio is clocked by an even higher quality design with hand selected crystals. Two of those are used, one for 44.1 kHz and one for 48 kHz base sampling frequencies. The output of the oversampling is fed into the DAC directly at 128 times the base sampling frequency. To give you a better insight in the signal paths through the MU2 I'll show you the block diagram from the manual. The signal flows from left to right. The analog input is sent directly to the selector, the volume control and the output switch to end up in the mains out or headphones out. Digital audio inputs enter via the FPGA to the DAC and then into the selectors. Streaming services, external and internal storage enter room server running on the computer and then enter the FPGA to further follow the equal paths as the digital inputs. As said you need to subscribe to Rune separately for either $150 per year or $830 for a lifetime subscription. Without Rune subscription the Mu1 and the Mu2 will not play. I'll advise you to buy a lifetime subscription. After 5.5 years you got the investment back and it will only get more expensive if you don't. When I bought my lifetime subscription 5 years ago I paid 450 euros. The next step is to install Rune software to control the player. Installers for Windows and macOS can be downloaded from the Rune Labs site. For Android and iOS devices you go to the appropriate app store. The software can be downloaded for free but will only work with a license. If you want to know more about Rune, watch my review Rune version 1.8 fresh and fast. Version 2 is already published but this video gives a good impression. Version 2 makes it possible to play music from the Rune server for instance from your Mu2 on your smartphone when you are on the road. The Mu2 volume control can be done from the Rune interface on your tablet, smartphone or computer, using the silver disc on top of the player or using an infrared remote control. You can program the Mu2 to listen to instructions of any infrared remote control. I'll get back to this. Using the silver disc you can also change settings but these can be done in the HTML interface too. Using the disc you can open the menu by holding it for a few seconds. It shows the standby menu and when rotating the disc you see this menu. Scrolling further down there is a page that shows a QR code. Scanning that code with your phone or tablet or typing the URL shown in the display in your browser gives you this screen. On the left side you see the volume slider, below it the headphones button that switches the output from main output to headphones output, below it the input selectors and the power button. The right part of the screen shows what's playing, nothing at the moment and shows the skip and play pause buttons. Top right a button to the settings of the Mu2. 
Here the LED brightness, display brightness, startled volume and headphones offset can be set. The startup volume is for people that connect the power amp or active loudspeakers directly to the Mew 2. It prevents extremely high volumes when powered on. Further down, after opening the source settings, you can rename the inputs for instance TV, CD player and so on. Scrolling further down and opening the iAir programming lets you program the infrared remote. If your amp has a remote control that also has CD keys, you can use these. Simply click or tap on for instance standby and press the standby key on the remote. Do the same with play pause and other buttons and you're set. Never seen it this easy. The Mewtwo was connected over the usual Grim Audio SQM XLR cables to the Air Acoustics AX520 that drives the PMC FAC12 signature loudspeakers on stack audio over 70 isolators and connected over AudioQuest Robinhood Zero loudspeaker cable. The network connection comes from the Zixel GS1900-10HP switch and is filtered by the Network Acoustics Muon Pro. From the Zixel switch there is a fiber connection to the third floor where the Netgear ProSafe GS418 TPP switch connects to the Intel NUC 10i7 FNH that runs Rock on an M.2 SSD and has the music stored on an internal 8TB SSD. A CAT6 patch cable connects a Zissel switch to the internet modem and to the TP-Link Deco M4 mesh network that provides Wi-Fi access to the iPad Pro 2 used to control room. The equipment was placed in a Creative Trend 3 rack. I used both the internal Rune server in the Mew 2 and the Rune server in my Intel NUC. The latter was done since I have all my reference music and playlists on it. This is one of the things that shows the versatility of Rune. My Grim Audio Mu 1, the DACLESS one, has an 8TB SSD internal drive, but when the music library becomes too large or actually the metadata that comes with it, the Intel i3 in the Mu player becomes sluggish. Since I already had the Intel NUC and since the Mu player can also function as a Rune endpoint, I can work with either the Rune server in a Mu player or with the Rune server in the NUC that has an Intel i7 processor. Mounting an i7 board in the Mu players was no option since it would require forced cooling and you don't want fan spinning in a high end player in your listening room. I think that the Mu players Rune server can comfortably work with 4000 to 5000 albums, 50000 or 65000 tracks. If your collection is bigger, consider an external server with i7 processor. I hear no difference between the internal Rune server and the Rune server on the NUC. I'm already rather spoiled with the Mu1 with Core Dave. You might want to watch my reviews of the Core Days first. And it might be interesting to view the Cord M Scaler review too. I will put links in the description below. When I exchanged the player I used then, the Aurelic Ares G2 and Cord M Scaler for the Mu1, I said the following in my review. I have a problem here, for I'm not sure I'm able to fully describe what I'm hearing. The Aurelic Cord Scaler and DAC is already of rather high quality, but the Mu1 goes beyond that in a special way. It's no longer the stereo image, the low lows or the high highs that makes a difference. Nor is it time smearing. All these what the Mu1 brings is ease, relaxation, without getting dull, for if the dynamics is needed, they are there. I hate it when people say that, for instance, a tube amp sounds warmer, for it might mean coloration or time smearing in the lows. When I say that the Mu1 has a warm sound, I mean none of these things. I also dislike the phrase, it sounds analog. But the Mu1 does sound perfectly analog in the mids and highs and perfectly digital in the lows. It's the best of both worlds. And then I mean tape recorder analog, 
not vinyl analog. Today I think that it is due to both extremely clean and well clocked AES EBU signal and the pure Nyquist top sampler. When I now connect the Cord Dave to the Magna Mano 3 Farad streamer I use in my reference set of 1B, it is quite a step back as all described in the Mu1 review. But when I compare the Dave and the Mu1 combination with the Mu2, both connected over Grim Audio SQM XLR cables and with a network acoustic Mu1 AES EBU cable between the Mu1 and the Dave, it is difficult to hear the difference at first. It's only when listening for a longer period that the differences become clear. The Mu2 is even more relaxed, stress free than the Mu1 Dave combination and voices are so clean. I don't mean clinically clean, I mean free of aberrations that make them sound artificial. That's already the case with the Mu1 Dave combination but it goes even further with the Mu2. Another difference is in the lows where more texture can be heard. Combined with the fantastic bass reproduction and open mid-range of the PMC loudspeakers, it gives an extremely well controlled and open low end. This is so beautiful. Did I mention those voices? So natural. Getting back to earth there are conclusions to be made. The Mu2 cost 17,990 euros including 21% VAT but excluding the room subscription. The Mu1 cost 12,750 euros and the Cord Dave 12,799 euros adding up to 25,549 euros again including VAT and excluding a room license. That makes the Mu1 Dave combination 7,559 euros more expensive while I clearly prefer the sound quality of the Mu2. It also means that the Mu1 probably will go back to its intended purpose of being the source for Grim Audio, LS1 and other active loudspeakers with digital input. For I would be surprised if you could find a separate DAC of the same quality as the major DAC in the Mu2 for the 7,000 559 euros difference. That makes the Mu2 a bargain despite the fact that 18 grand is a lot of money. I have to do a lot of thinking. Remains to say that the Grim players come with a standard warranty of 2 years that can be elongated to 5 years for free by registering. This brings us to the end of probably the longest video I have ever made. Next week at Friday 5 pm Central European time there will be a normal length video again. If you don't want to miss that, subscribe to this channel or follow me on Patreon, Facebook or Instagram so you will be informed when new videos are out. Help me reach even more people by giving this video a thumb up or link to this video on the social media. It is much appreciated. Many thanks to those viewers that support this channel financially. It keeps me independent and lets me improve the channel further. If that makes you feel like supporting my work too, the links are in the comments below this video on YouTube. I'm Hans Beekhuizen, thank you for watching and see you next week. And whatever you do, enjoy the music.